Hello, and welcome back. Over the years, I have tried to classify my relatives using the Yanomami and Western-based kinship system. I have zero to little knowledge and training in Yanomami genealogy, so I found the task to be a little bit difficult, yet fascinating. The Yanomami, whether you're genetically related or not, will give you a kinship term uh, after they get to know you or gain trust. At first, one can begin as a nohi, which can be translated as friend. Then after a while, if they trust you and, you've, and they've seen you quite often in the village, they'll, they'll give you a, a, a term that's a little bit more familial. Um, so they may call you an aunt or an uncle or brother-in-law or even brother. So depending on how they see your place within their village. In my village, I skipped the nohi phase because I am Yanomami by blood and I am immediately plugged into this complicated network and matrix of lineages and kinships. Trip after trip, I have tried to get a little bit more about uh, how to uh, refer my, my, my family members. My brother, Ricky, uh, is not my full brother, he's considered my half-brother. But in the Yanomami society, they don't say half-brother, they just say brother, or as I had called him, Oshe. So he was my Oshe, or brother. Shori means brother-in-law. So if I were to be called Shori, or in my village, or even in a different village, I may not exactly be brother-in-law as we define it here in Western society, but maybe in that person's mind, uh, I could be either married or potentially married to a girl in the village that's related to him, so he would just call me Shori. One year, I was introduced to a man, um, and my mother uh, told me that I was to call this man Hape. And hape can mean father. I say can mean because it does have other meanings under different contexts. And uh, this man was my mother's husband. And since he called me moka, which is sort of a term of endearment that uh, a man would say to a son, um, I, just, I just called him father in my field notes. But uh, maybe father isn't the most accurate translation for hape. Um, I really don't know. But uh, that's just how I kept track of him. The following year, uh, when I I had come home to the U.S. and returned to the Yanomami territory. Uh, my mom got divorced, and um, and in, in Yanomami culture, when they say divorce, they call it a hoyoremo, which means to to throw away, to separate from. So he threw him away and got a different husband. And she told me that I was to call him Hape, and I'm like, oh great, another another father to keep track of in my field notes. And I remember saying to to mom in English, like, geez, mom, you gotta you gotta settle down here. You know, I'm. I'm I don't know how many more fathers I can tolerate, but uh, of course I was, I was being facetious. This is a sliver of what I mean by some of the challenges and, and difficulties and trying to figure out you know, who's related to me and who to call what. And, and to really get it down, you have to spend a lot of time um, in the village and with your family. And unfortunately, I don't spend months and months and months and months at a time. At most, I've only spent a couple months or so. And, um, but I hope that over the years that I'll finally get to piece it all together and really know who my family members are from a Yanomami perspective and a West perspective. For example, in this video, um, where my my uncle was giving me my Yanomami name, uh, and uh, he also called me Hekamaya. And Hekamaya means uh, nephew or the son of your sister. Um, in other parts of the territory, I've learned that it could also mean grandson. And at first, I called him grandfather. But it wasn't until I came home and, and, and talked to my dad, uh, my, my real dad here in the US, um, and figured out that he was truly my uncle. So sometimes it does take that kind kind of um, investigation to figure out who is who and, and, and how they're related to you. So since he was my uncle, I called him uh, Shawape, and he's my, my Shawape. The Yanomami have different terms for cousins, and this is, um, especially from a, a male-centric point of view, is a very important uh, classification to get right because depending on how that cousin is related to you can determine whether or not you are able to marry that cousin. For example, the daughter of your father's brother is your parallel cousin, and the daughter of your mother's sister is your parallel cousin. The daughter of your father's sister is a cross cousin, and the daughter of your mother's brother are also cross cousins. So for me here in the US, I don't really go around wondering who's my parallel cousin or cross cousin. They're all just 
cousins to me and you know they're, they all have the same degree of relatedness to me genetic relatedness but in Yanomami culture they have different meanings a parallel cousin is I would be considered taboo and incestual if you were to marry that person however a cross cousin is not taboo and that is a potential mate so you can marry your cross cousin in Yanomami culture and um, not that you're, you're not that every cross cousin is going to be your wife but when trying to figure out who is a potential mate or a potential wife or potential husband um, in Yanomami village uh, that's how they determine between the two so where I come into play you know I am Yanomami by birth I have Yanomami blood and I'm son of a Yanomami woman so therefore you know I am, am automatically immediately plugged into this kinship network this kinship matrix so if I am automatically plugged in, therefore, I have cross cousins. And therefore, some of those cross cousins could be considered my wives or potential wife. Now, in Yanomami society, it's not normal, I guess you could say. It's, it's or unnatural or it just gets, it goes against the order of things to not be married. Um, and there's no such thing really as a, a single person, or at least not for too long, you know? And, and I, I understand, you, you need a partner to survive. You need, you need a mate so that you can have children so that those children can you know, eventually grow up and, and, and give you food and protect you. And, and, and at all, while it does happen at a family unit, it all happens collectively as a village in order for a village to live. So to make a conscientious decision to not get married or have kids is, um, I guess it's, it's just it's just not normal. But don't get me wrong. I mean, to to people um, get married and, and and fall in in love. I guess you could say uh, where um, they they have affectionate feelings for each other and, and and love and affection is a big part of of a healthy relationship, even in Yanomami society. But it takes on a different hue. It, it you know I grew up in in New Jersey. So my concept, my idea of courtship and and love and marriage is is been been influenced by my understanding and, and living here in the US where you know that doesn't necessarily translate into how two people um, can get married in, in Yanomami society. So, you know, um, yeah, there are feelings of, of affection and love, but there isn't this Western Shakespearean notion of like, oh, I'm falling for someone or something like that. Naturally, being the son of a Yanomami um, and being part of this culture and being the fact that I didn't have a wife at the time, um, you know, my mom and the headman of the village came up to me and said, uh, you know, uh, introduced to me to these two women and said, uh, this is your wife and this is your wife. And this happened on day one. It wasn't sort of processual like, uh, um, you know, where I met a person and then, you know, developed some kind of relationship and whatever. No, this was decided long before I even arrived, most likely, or maybe it wasn't decided, it was just understood, you know, because I'm part of the kinship network, it's just understood that this person is my wife. And this person was also my cross cousin. So um, at many uh, levels, I was sort of in this intercultural dilemma. I hadn't the slightest clue what it means to be a Yanomami husband or what it means to be married. And I was I was 23 years old and uh, ready to take on the world. And, and it didn't matter what culture I was in, you know, US or Yanomami Amazonian, I wasn't gonna get married to anybody. Um, and first of all, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how to live day by day in the Amazon jungle and try to reunite with my mom. But, you know, for my mom, I think she sees me as someone who had been gone for 20 years um, and, and during those 20 years missed out on this opportunity uh, 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 to have you know, more grandkids and to see me grow up with a wife and have a family there. And I think she sees uh, that, you know, that this is now her time to take me and to, to try to cement my place in the village and what better way than to get married and have kids. So mom was adamant about me having a wife. And um, so I remember, you know, trying to figure out who to call who. And I pointed to this girl 
and she said sua. So sua is like woman or, or wife in, 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 in Yanomami, and I was to be your hearope, which is uh, one way of saying husband. So um, yeah, so three hours in, not only did I find my mom, but I found my family, but I also found apparently my two wives. So it was um, a very uh, interesting you know, dilemma. Uh, here's, a, here's a short clip of, of, of who I'm talking about. This is my wife, uh, wife number one. <laughs> I don't know their names. <laughs> this is wife number one. I don't know where wife number two is. This is my family. I meant no offense by calling them wife number one and wife number two. Uh, it was it was um, you know difficult for me to keep track of them in my field notes. You can't. You, the Yanomami don't give their names because it's taboo to speak their name, and um, and 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 it was. At the time, they didn't have any really Spanish nicknames that I was aware of, so I didn't know what to refer to them. So just to keep track in my field notes, I just uh, um, you know called them wife number one and wife number two, and um, w and for them it was really you know if I were to share this with them, not that I don't think they would maybe understand the joke, but um, it's really no laughing matter to them. But for me, I was you know anxious and nervous about this whole situation, so uh, it was it was good for me to shed some comedic light on this whole this whole conflict. To complicate my understanding of the whole Yanomami kinship network, um, my my wife or quote unquote wife um, already has a husband, so. I just got more and more confused as the day went on. And when I found out that, you know, he had a husband, it kind of like changed my mood a little bit because, you know, I could laugh this off and kind of joke around. But when I was told that this woman was to be my wife and she already has a husband, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I got scared because I thought he was going to, you know, get angry or jealous or whatever. And, and, and it was for a few weeks, you know, there was some tensions between me and, and these men. And I couldn't figure out like, what did they expect of me or did they accept the situation? After a few weeks, you know, the, 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 uh, the tensions kind of de-escalated and, and I, I became sort of uh, closer to my wife's husband's. Um, and I later learned that they are also considered my brothers. Um, not an Oshe, not an Osheya, like like my my half brother, but a different kind of brother. And, and I'm still kind of working everything out in terms of the kinship terms. After some time had passed, I kind of thought that like, okay, the joke's behind us. Yeah, you know, it's all fun and games. And they gave me a wife. Ha ha ha. Okay, now let's move on. But mom didn't forget, and she was adamant in reminding me um, of my um, husbandly duties. And there were there were a couple of times when you know she instructed the girl to climb into my hammock um, there were times when um, you know she had scolded me or reprimanded me for not impregnating them and not having children and it was it, and I I didn't know what to make of all of this and despite my refusal to marry them you know I I, I did end up developing a very good friendship and camaraderie um, with my with my classificatory wives you know they were very nice and friendly they taught me um, a lot about the language they're very patient and in uh, very patient and teaching me you know how to go crabbing and collect firewood and weave baskets and 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 uh, they liked this and as well as the rest of the village found this uh, very amusing because these are tasks normally reserved for women but at the time I wanted to you know I wanted to hang out with mom as much as I can, can and, and as much as I could and I wanted to learn everything about in Yanomama culture. Keep back home domestically you can imagine some of the difficult conversations that I've had to have with my significant other here. Imagine you know your your boyfriend goes away to the jungle comes back and says uh, hey honey um, well I have two wives in the Amazon, so um, it you know it t takes a, uh, a little bit of patience and, and explanations as to how everything is in Yanomama culture. And so after all these years, I was so sure that the my mom and the village had kind of forgotten about all of it. But uh, in my last expedition, uh, several months ago, in the beginning of this year, uh, I was in for a bit of a surprise. My team and I were just kind of hanging around the fire. I had um, I was with uh, my good friend who's a translator and. Uh, um, you know, and the rest of the Good Project team, and we were just kind of hanging out. There were other Yanomami nearby, and um, 
and 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 I noticed that the headman uh, had gotten out of his hammock and walked straight towards this uh, uh, young girl. She was very beautiful, um, and she had all these really long he e sticks and a painted face and the feathers and um, very 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 well adorned. And she he had a very rather serious demeanor, and he said some words to her. He looked up at me and he pointed at me, right, and then exchanged a few more words and then just walked away. And there was this sort of like momentary silence uh, and, and, and I wouldn't say shock, but kind of like a little bit surprised. And, and we all looked at each other. And um, I knew enough Yanomami to get an idea of what he was saying, but I wanted to confer with my translator. And I said, hey, what, what did he just say? He just pointed at me. And, um, and he just, he had a wide grin and just kind of chuckled. And he said, uh, David, David tiene mucho mujeres. <laughs> and he's saying that David has many women. And, uh, and we all just laughed. But for me, I was thinking, oh no, here we go again. You know, uh, I'm going to have another wife. And, and basically what uh, that man was saying was that this, this girl, um, and it's a girl that they would call Suwahuri. And Suwahuri means on the path to be a woman. And what he was doing was betrothing this girl to be my, my future wife and was telling her that I was to be her future husband. Uh, so it uh, doesn't look like uh, my troubles are going to go away anytime soon. I do feel bad. Honestly, really bad for my mom. I, I, I feel like I, I'm greatly disappointing her, but that's just the nature of our really unique intercultural family. You know, we are two families that are part of two radically different societies and, and very different family structures and very different approaches on, on, on life and, and, and development and growth. Sure, I am honored and grateful to be part of two worlds, but it's not always perfect and certainly it's not always idyllic. Well, that's my story. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to the next one. Take care. Bye.